we've been going through the Gospel of John on and off, mostly on for probably what, like a year and a half or something. <laughs> wow. I've <laughs> been taking my time. Like I said, there's, there's been some off. We've got some on the tape for a while. There's, I think, like a three or four month stretch, we did something different. But um, you just, overall, I, when, when I felt God telling me to tackle the book of John, I didn't feel like it was something he wanted us to rush through. And so I'm wanting to get into the nitty gritty and, and pull the details out of it because there's such wealth in here. Um, this is, oftentimes, this is the book that you hear people being sent to. It's like when you're a new believer or or maybe you're not a believer at all, it's like, hey, why don't you read this Gospel of John tract I've got for you? It's like, here, just take this, read that, and, and I think that will answer a lot of questions. And it's beautiful because this is where so many people start their journey of faith. But you know what? It's got everything we need in order to get in much deeper in our faith, too. Because that, that's the goal God gave us this book for. It, it, it's so that we would know him. And so we would come to see how wonderful, how great, how good, how awesome he is. And we would move from unbelief to belief in every single area of life. And that, that John tells us, I, I forget where it is exactly. I think it's the second to the last chapter. I'm not going to look for it. Um, but... He tells us that the purpose he wrote this book is so that we would believe. And that's such a major part of everything that's being said here. Is It, it, it comes down to Jesus going in the countryside, doing these teachings, dealing with people, and, and performing miracles sometimes. And it's all aimed so that we would understand who he is, and that we would believe him. Because once we do changes everything <laughs> and so we come into john 15 and um it's really kind of cool to me how, how half of the gospel of john it's kind of different half of it is like the three and a half years of ministry and then the second half is kind of like the last week of his life and john really wants to bring us in and show us what was happening in, in behind closed doors when jesus was talking to his disciples there, there's not crowds following him. There aren't unbelievers all over the place. There's not Pharisees trying to test him and trip him up. No one trying to give him a gotcha moment, anything like that. It's just him and these guys who have given up everything to follow him for years now. And he knows that the end is coming up. This is happening basically Thursday night, and he died on Friday. He knows he's got 24 hours to live, less than. And so he's really bringing it home. He's trying saying, okay, guys, we need to have a serious talk. And there's some things you guys need to know. And that's where John 15 is. It's in the middle of that conversation. And so he draws this whole illustration. I'm going to go ahead and I'm, this has, has become my custom. I want to back up to the beginning of the chapter just so that we don't lose the taste of what's being said. So let's get into John 15. Chapter 15, verse 1, says this. It says, I am the true grapevine. My father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit. And he prunes branches that do bear fruit, so they will produce even more. You've already been pruned and purified by the message I've given you. Remaining in me, and I Four. Four. Okay. Thank you. I was trying to go in three. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine. And you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine, and you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want and it will be granted. When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. And this brings great glory to my Father. I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. 
When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love, just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love. I've told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. <laughs> this is my commandment. Love each other the same way I have loved you. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you slaves because a master does not confide in his slaves. Now, you are my friends. Since I told you everything the Father told me, you didn't choose me. I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit so that the Father will give you whatever you ask for using my name. This is my commandment, to love each other. And so he goes through this whole thing, and he, to me, the, the central part of this chunk of what he's saying is this whole remain in me, or, or as some versions will say, abide in me, it gives us the idea that we need to live every moment in him, and that any moment we're not, guess what? Suddenly the fruitfulness starts going away. If I kind of liken it to a phone, you know, if we've got the phone plugged in, it's charging and it has power, but to pull that plug, it has a limited lifespan, basically. Mm -hmm. If you leave the phone plugged in the whole time, theoretically, it should last forever, right? Theoretically. Um, we're the same way. When we stay plugged into him, we can do amazing things. Things that the church, at least here in the States, has forgotten we can do. The church is supposed to look like what we see in the book of Acts. Mm -hmm. And we see Peter and John performing miracles. We see Paul, you know, people are so anxious to get around to Paul because he's healing people. And, and they're like, if I can just get near his path where his shadow falls on me, I'll be healed. I mean, some amazing things that happen. And that's what the church is supposed to look like. But central to all of that isn't so much the miracles. Miracles are cool. Don't get me wrong. That would be awesome to be able to go into a hospital and clear it out. I'd love to see that happen. Uh -huh. But it's not the way it works. Um, and that's not the main thing that's meant to draw people in. Yes, miracles catch people's attention, but it's not what holds people's attention. Because as exciting as it is to see somebody get healed or to get healed, that's not what keeps us. It comes down to that love that he's talking about. And so I want to stop and I really want to drill in. I'm starting, I believe it's in verse 12. So let's get into this, because it's all about this question of what, really what is love. Uh, so we need to answer that question. I think we're going to see a little bit of that in what we're talking about today. So verse 12 is really where we start to focus on. So this is my commandment, love each other in the same way I have loved you. You guys remember, uh, there's other places in the Bible like one of the Pharisees came up to him and said, hey, what's the most important commandment of all? And Jesus said, well, the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, with all your soul, and all your strength. And the second is like it, to love your neighbor as you love yourself. And so that, that second part of that, that love your neighbor like you love yourself, Provided we're in a healthy place, that's kind of the basic assumption there, um, that we're in a healthy place and we actually like ourselves. Um, the assumption is there for that we should love others like that. And that's what he tells us. But suddenly he brings things into where he knows he's got a group full of followers. There's 12 people in this upper room right now. Jesus and 11 disciples, because Jesus is scary, if you remember. The guy who's going to betray him has already left the room. 
So literally, every single person in this room is all in on the kingdom of God. They've given up whatever it takes in order to follow Jesus. And so he's here with his disciples, his followers. I guess you could probably say the first group of Christians. And he hands them not just the same commandment of love your neighbor like you love yourself. He draws things deeper. He says, I want you to love each other like I love you. Like I have loved you. And more to the point, he's going to give them a, an illustration that um, really telling, considering what's about to happen, that he's about to go to the cross and die for them and for us. So he gets in there and he gives them that command in verse 12, but he doesn't stop there. He says, there's no greater love than to lay down your life for one's friends. Love requires sacrifice. It's why we have a core value at this church uh, of love even when it hurts. Because love when it's convenient isn't necessarily real love. Because anybody can do that. When it gets hard, when he gets downright painful, that's when we're loving like what God loves us. And that's what he's talking about there. He, he's asking us, are you willing to give it all? You know, for the guys in this room, basically, for the people, for us in this room, are you willing to lay down whatever it is? Is there anything that in your life that you're holding more precious than your life? Okay, are you ready to lay that down for each other? That's what he's talking about. This is the motivation of Jesus in the gospel. This is what makes the gospel literally good news. It's because God loved the world so much that he was willing to die for us. He's showing us this is how I love you. This is how I love everybody, but I want you to love each other this way. It's not the first time or the last time he gives this kind of command. Check out verse 14, because he gives a little bit of a, an odd verse. And I know I've talked about this sort of thing in the past. Verse 14 he says, you are my friends if you do what I command. And um, he said in the past that if you love me, will obey my commandments as well. And I've talked before that that for years I interpreted that as a way to um, that kind of was an emotional um, frankly just an emotional appeal to try to guilt us into obeying and that's not what it's about. He, he's not placing a condition on us like okay if you love me then you'll make sure that you do this. No, he's saying basically that when you actually love, when it, it's the kind of love that we're supposed to have for them, when we get to that point and start growing beyond it, we start to obey and it just comes. And I, it, it's still not easy, don't get me wrong. There's still challenges. There's still temptations that are gonna derail us, maybe for a long time even. But the point is that we come back, and in the end, there's still that love that drives us to do what pleases him. And, and so he kind of draws things out for us a little bit. He says, you know, that friends are willing to die for friends, okay? And so we're his friends. And he asks us this simple thing that, you know, basically, are you willing to lay things down for your life down, your friend? And it comes down to when we have a friend, if they're a real friend, the, the answer to this question should be obvious. Do you trust your friend? A real friend, a true friend, do you trust them? Well, the only answer is probably yes. 
I think that's almost always given. <clears throat> There's other relationships we have. Maybe we're friendly with someone, maybe we do call them friend, but there's like, there's this wall of distrust. It's like, I can help you out, but I can't trust you completely. Maybe it's something small, like I can't trust you to be on time. I don't know, whatever it is, but there's, there's something that's blocking the friendship from being everything it should be. And it's that distrust. But with real friends, we don't have that. And so, it starts with trust, just like it does us trusting God, okay? And when we have a friend and they talk to us, what do we do? Right? We just listen. And, and so much of us, this is something our culture's kind of wired us to do, is that when somebody talks and we're in a conversation, especially it's something where there's some emotional stuff going on maybe it's anger maybe it's excitement whatever it is things are getting passionate shall we say in one way or another and this conversation to start the tendency is to start to listen just enough so we can respond right that's what we like to do that's the, for some of us that's normal it's like we listen just enough so that we can say our piece okay it's like and, and sometimes we'll jump right in and we'll interrupt. It's like, okay, I'm going to say what I need to say and yours can wait, right? Mm -hmm. Real friendship doesn't treat people that way. Now, I know that's kind of a habit we formed and we need to break for some of us. And, um, but the point is that are you really listening? Because if we're listening, we don't just hear him. We're stopping, we're listening to understand. And then, uh, then after we understand, we respond. That's basically what Jesus is saying here. It's like, it's like if, you know, if you're my friend, you're going to obey my commands. You're going to listen to the things I have to say. You're going to understand them. And because you trust me, and you trust that I'm good and I know everything. I know all the details, everything that's gonna happen. So I got a perfect plan worked out for you. If you had a friend who knew everything and all the details of what was gonna come in the future and they told you, hey, I want you to invest in this stock, what are you gonna do? It's like, how can I liquidate everything I can to invest in that? That's what he's saying. It's like, if you trust me, obedience is going to come naturally because you know who I am. And that's the natural response. So he talks about that. Verse 15. Let's see. There it is. I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. Now you are my friends since I've told you everything the Father's told me. He says that we're his friends. That's what he calls us. But what I find interesting is that he calls us friends and he wants us to think of him as a friend. But I also see another side of that one because you read through the Bible and, and if you've read the Bible much, especially like in the New Testament with all the, uh, what's called the epistles, Galatians, Ephesians, those were written by Paul along with several others. And he almost always starts it off the exact same way. <laughs> so he introduces himself as Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, and a bond slave. He says that. He says, I'm a slave, I'm a servant. Depending on translation you read, but the idea is basically I'm a slave of Jesus. I find it interesting that he says that, but you know what? He's not the only one who says it that way. So it's not just Paul who came to Christ came to trust Christ after Jesus died and rose again and went back up into heaven. It wasn't just him. It's all these people that knew him too. So like Second Peter, I'm not gonna go to these places, but second, I wrote them down in my notes. It says, Second Peter chapter one, verse one. This letter is from Simon Peter, a slave and an apostle of Jesus Christ. So Peter, who walked around in three years, he's in the room right now and he's saying the same thing. I'm a slave of Jesus. 
Um, John, the guy who wrote this book that we're in, he also wrote the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 1, verse 1 says, This is a revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show his servants the events that must soon take place. He sent an angel to present his revelation to his servant, John. He's talking about himself as a servant. He didn't say, you know, this revelation is to the disciple whom Jesus loved. Like he usually refers to himself in the Gospel of John. He doesn't say to it, say to the apostle who's a friend of Jesus. He doesn't say that. He says to the servant. What I find more interesting is these two. The book of James. I said I wanted to turn them in and start to. Um, James chapter 1, verse 1 says, This letter is from James, a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in the upper room with Jesus and the disciples in where we are in John, there's a guy named James. He did not write the book of James, okay? It's a different James, okay? You know who that James was? Yes, Jesus' blood brother. That's something to call your brother. Yeah! <laughs> Caleb, would you call yourself a slave to Joshua? No. <laughs> Elias, would you call yourself a slave to Caleb? Nope. Never. Okay. This is what I'm saying. This is big stuff. Okay. James isn't referring to himself as this letter from James, a brother, you know, a slave of God, and a brother to the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. But it doesn't end there. Jude, chapter 1. Which there's only one chapter of Jude. But verse 1 says this. says that um, this letter is from Jude, a slave of Jesus Christ and a brother of James. We don't know for sure, for sure. But it sure looks like this Jude... <clears throat> Is James's brother, who is Jesus's brother. This guy's not even willing to say that he's not even willing to claim kinship correctly to Jesus. He, he goes around it. He's like, I'm slave of Jesus Christ and a brother of James. Oh, yeah. And, and, and you know, <laughs> if you bring the subject up, yes, we were raised by the same parents. We have the same mom. Okay. That's, I find that so interesting that all these times, these disciples whom Jesus is calling a friend right here, and yet they turn around and say, I'm an apostle, I'm a, I'm a servant, I, I, I'm a bond slave, I'm something to Jesus. But they, so there's this two different sides to the relationship. There's the fact that we are his friend. I mean, God calls Abraham friend of God. Mm -hmm. And we are friend, his friends. He, he says it point blank right there. There's no getting around it. And we need to remember that. But on the other hand, we also need to remember the flip side of that. That we're also, we were slaves to sin. And... and what happened on the cross was literally the spiritual price that had to be paid to buy us back from that slavery. He bought us, which means that technically he owns us. He just set us free. Yeah. 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 Now I got to find him because I tried to turn. All right. So, John chapter 15 again. And now we're in verse 16. Says so you didn't choose me, choose me. I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruits. And Father will give you whatever you ask for using my name. He chose you. He picked you. Yes, he's talking to his disciples, and he did. Literally, he goes around and says, "Peter, follow me. John, follow me. Andrew, follow me." He calls all these guys, and so in a literal way. He called them, but I, I'm, I don't want you to think that there's any less of a way that he's called you. That he has asked you to come follow him. He has chosen us. 
that was intention. It says how much he treasures us. He chose us to be his friends. He does this, but he doesn't do it for just anything. He, he has a reason. He tells us right there. He says, I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruits so the Father will give you whatever you ask for in my name. This is not about emotion. There have been um, surveys done um, of people like, uh, if you guys kind of know your American church history, there's a guy dead long before I was born named Neil Moody. A lot of people consider him the best evangelist in the U.S. Um, not only one way to stretch. Um, but at the end of every message, he gave this stirring emotional story and would basically use that story to create a bridge to ask people, basically, are, do you want to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior? And, and masses of people would come to Christ who threw up Moody the saying. They followed up on those people. And a lot of those people weren't following Jesus just a few years later. Matter of fact, it wasn't even a close race. It was the vast majority of people were following the line. And I find that interesting because there's another evangelist in American history named Charles Finney. And he was very matter of fact. He told you what it was. He told you the gospel like it is. And he basically just presented saying, here, this is the good news. Jesus died for you. Is that something you want? Do you want to take Jesus as your Lord and Savior today? And um, people would come, and just like with the old movie, people would come down in droves. And they followed up with Trinity's converts. And years later, the majority of them were still following. And I think the reason is because of that emotional appeal. And this is something the church has been guilty of. I mean, if you've been in church very long, you know, usually at the end of the sermon, there's an invitational song. And it's usually a good, stirring song. And there's that guy on the keyboards who's just playing that nice music while the pastor's talking and praying. And, uh, and then they make that plea at the end. Is today the day? Maybe it is. God uses that in a lot of ways. I mean, there were still thousands of converts that he only brought to Christ. But it, 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 I'm not a hugely emotional guy. You guys know me by now for the most part. So I, I'm not the guy who's standing up here with a tearjerker story trying to get you to come up and give your life to Christ. I'm the guy who's going to make a reasoned, well, reason to follow him. That's, that's the way my brain works. That's, that's just me. Um, and I think this is part of it, is that I don't want somebody to come along and say that there was an emotional manipulation of any sort that was going on. It's not to say that we never do a little an invitational song at the end, because we have, we will. It's going to happen again. But it, it, it's not every day. And I think that's part of what he's saying here in verse 16. When he says, I chose you, I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit. Everything he wants us to pour our life into is about eternity. And emotional experiences can feel real in that moment. And they can feel real for a while. The question is, does it last? And the simple fact is that emotions go away. Anya and I were passionately in love 24 years ago, the day before we got married. And, and it was a very emotional thing. Our, our anniversary is tomorrow. Yes, our anniversary is tomorrow. Um, and so it's not that we don't love each other now, because if anything, honestly, I believe we love each other more. But it, it's of a different quality than it was, okay? It, it's not just this emotional thing that was going on. 
we've got 24 years worth of reasons to love each other and not like each other, but love each other anyway. You want to show them? <laughs> Am I digging myself a hole? That word lasting is the same as abiding. It's the exact same word that he used. There you go. So he wants, he wants us to pour our life into things, or our love into things that last. And that amounts to him. Because it, as powerful as it is to have that emotional appeal, it's not as powerful as you going, living life as a true follower of Jesus every day, abiding in him, weaving in him into every part of life. <laughs> and they see that. And maybe their family, maybe they knew you from before. Or maybe they had, didn't know you before, but they see the difference between you and everybody else. And that's powerful. That's what they're talking about when people say, you may be the only Bible that people ever read. And so, he wants our fruit to remain. And it, it takes, again, just like he said up in verses 4 and 5, remain in me, I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine. You cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. You cannot be fruitful unless you remain in him, unless you abide in him. So we've got to abide in him every day, all day, if we want people to see the difference. Can you please say that again? I don't know. Yeah. You said to remain in me or to not be separate. Can you just read that again? I can try that again. Yeah. So let me read that verse again. Verse 4. Remain in me, I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit of itself unless it's, if it is severed from the vine. And you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. And he's asking us to produce fruit, but not just any fruit, fruit that remains forever, that abides forever. Okay? And so we cannot produce that unless we are living every moment in him. Would you say, I'm so selfish. No, you're Would you say that would be like also how we come together as the body of Christ? It should be. Wow. It better be or we're not doing it right. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It should be part of every piece of life. I mean, honestly, that's the, for most people, that's the easiest place to bring it and live a life for Jesus and, and talk about Jesus is here at church where there's other believers. Well, I think mean, this gives me strength when we're all in here together. Mm -hmm. It gives me strength. It gives me peace. Like this is the this is a place that we can just be who we need to be. Yeah. And then we go out into the the battle, but we get to come here and be together. Peace. Battles up there. Yeah, <laughs> it is. And I'm not going to lie, because honestly. It comes back down to um, that love each other. Honestly, who are, if, if you've got a church history, the odds are pretty good. The hardest people to love are people inside the church building. So I'm just being honest. How many people you guys have been hurt at church by somebody? I have. And yet here I am starting up a church. And so many people that have left church behind and decided to never come back, it's because of the people inside. It ain't because of Jesus. Sometimes we're the hardest people to love. Maybe that's why Jesus is saying, love each other like I have loved you. Unconditional. You think? The church is the God. Yeah, we are. I don't even know how many hundreds of denominations there are. Uh, and it's not, it doesn't even end there. It's like this Baptist church is competing with this Baptist church, and this church Christ is competing with this church Christ, and this Methodist church is competing with this Methodist church. And it's like, I think we're on the same team. Yeah, <laughs> under the same lordship. Yeah. yeah. That's what it comes down to. It, it, it's it's this love. And we're supposed to love each other even when it hurts. That's why that's one of our core values. Love even when it hurts. Hey, Rob, you know, like Tanya was saying, the battle's out there, not in here. 
I say a lot of times the battle is in the church with the different denominations and everything. And instead of being unified under God, a lot of times the different churches are the battle yeah. for people. Competition is true. And and, um, and thank goodness that's not out. Yeah. I try really hard uh, to get together with other pastors and build friendships. I mean, I can try harder. Don't get me wrong. Um, and, and, you know, I like helping people out. And I love, I don't know if you heard, Kathy um, talked with us Friday morning about basically saying, hey, we should volunteer the resources that we have as a church to other churches. So, like, we have a couple of unique items, like top work and snow cone things like that you know the things that we have we can we can go to other churches and say hey look you need help you know honestly i was um i went thursday morning to a men's prayer breakfast that abiding life fellowship here in comanche mm -hmm. hosts and um part of what the things that they asked prayer for was that it, they're getting ready to do vbs vacation bible school and, and they're like we need people to help. Pray that people will show up. And I was thinking, maybe I could ask my people. Say what? Maybe we could ask our CBS. We could go and maybe help mm -hmm. them out. Or, or it doesn't have to be them, because Biden Life is far from the only church putting on VBS. But I'll bet you just about every place it is VBS, Vacation Bible oh, School. Sorry, I'm not announcing that clearly. Someone in the front row is it? And the back row, too. I need a little start. Project Vacation Bible School, VBS. Vacation Bible School. So, yeah. But the point is that there's churches have all kinds of things going on, and we're taking it relatively easy this summer. We're not doing a VBS. We never have. But there's lots of other things that we're not doing either. And, and part of that is to let you guys recharge your batteries so that, you know, come fall, we can hit the ground running again. But maybe God had us stepping back from our ministry so that maybe we can go and help out other churches. I'm not telling you that's what you need to do. Is that something you're going to have to pray about as individuals? But I'm saying the need is out there. And I, I seriously consider going up and saying, hey, you know, how can I help? And I know I got one day I couldn't make it, but they're having VBS at Abiding Life. But other days I'm coming help. So I agree with you. I will never. I was having my quiet time with the Lord maybe last maybe two weeks ago. The word that He gave me was the body of Christ that come together, meeting as in other churches, including convention. And so I. Mm. And, and I get it. Part of the reason you guys are here is probably because you've tried other places and have not felt like that's the right place. I get it. I've been there. I've done that. So, um, but they're still family. And if that weird uncle that you don't really enjoy being around calls you up and says, hey, I can use your help on Saturday. Yeah, maybe, maybe you do go and help. So. <laughs> At any rate, um, verse 17, I kind of close my Bible. It basically comes down to, again, he's just telling us, love each other. This is the sort of thing it looks like. This is what, it, I mean, it, maybe it means going and helping out another church. Maybe it means selling something so that you can help somebody in this room who's having a hard time making bills this month. I don't know. We're going to have to play it case by case. But the point is, is that in John chapter 13, this is kind of my last thing. So just a few verses previous, or sorry, a couple of chapters previous. John chapter 13, verse 34 and 35. So now I am giving you a new commandment. Love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. It ain't your your witness. It ain't how well you love the people who are outside of the church. Although that that I'll be honest, that is a pretty convincing thing. 
But we should love each other so well that people want to be a part. That they see what's going on, they're like, man, I wish I had people like that. How can I get in? And the church is unfortunately known globally. It's not just here in the U.S. It's not just here in Comanche. Church is known for division. I mean, how many of us in school, in history class, studied the Reformation? That's the first church split. It was there. I'm not saying there wasn't some reason. I can see Kate, I'm sorry, Elijah, back there kind it of. It was not the first church split, but oh well. <laughs> first, first major church split. How about that? Anyway, all right. But you really picked over the prayer part. Prayer part? Okay. You think that's all about when we pray, you will receive what we have in Jesus' name. Ah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it kind of plays over that a little bit. But yeah, point is that when we're abiding in Him, all of this becomes possible. The ability to love each other as loud as we are inside the church becomes doable. Loving people outside the church, as flawed as they are, becomes doable. The things we ask for become given. I'm not trying to say that if you ask God for riches, he's going to give you riches. But it might be that if you ask God for enough money to help somebody with a bill, he'll give it to you. Desires become his desires when we're abiding. Yeah, yeah. and, and his desires become <laughs> our desires. Right. Exactly. So, yeah. It changes us. Yeah. When we abide in him like we're supposed to, it fundamentally changes us. Yeah. And you're actually, so surrendering, not just like the, I always have to surrender my every move, but next year, it's like when you finally decide, I'm going to surrender my will over to the Lord. Right, and whatever it is that you want from me, give me that, take that on my heart, give me that mm -hmm. desire to desire with me. Desire. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. And remember that the only work we have to do as believers is believe, but that belief really means trust. Do you trust him? Do you trust him with everything? All right, I've gone long enough. So, let's pray, and then we'll wrap things up. Lord God, I just thank you so much for your goodness and your grace. And God, I trust you. And I know I don't trust you enough. I, I fall short in so many areas, so many times. But I'm just asking you for a renewal in each and every one of us, that you would help us to remember how good you are, how trustworthy you are, and to live our lives in such a way that we do trust you, not just at one point in the day or two points in the day, but just all day long. It's just the way we live. And it's like breathing. That's what I really want. I have you in every crack and crevice of my life, every every room, every closet, everything. You know. Help us. Help us because we desperately can't do it without you. We need you. So work in our hearts. Remind us. Don't let us forget. Make it just be like this sign hanging right in front of our faces that's neon and blinking and maybe even has a siren. I don't know. But just make it obvious so that we don't forget. We just need you in all of life. Because you fit. You fit perfect. And life gets better. Thank you so much. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.